to record to this. Yeah, so we captured. All right. Uh, let me get Great. this message off the screen here so that we can see you. Uh, go go ahead. Uh, there's okay. just you, you don't you don't see it, so it's no problem. Okay, no worries. Uh, yeah, great to join. Jeff, mm. just how long would you like me to go for? You know, I, <laughs> just... I, yeah, I, I think we, we would just have, um, uh, you know, make it kind of conversationally. So we'll have a couple rounds, so a couple bites of okay, the great. So maybe just kick us off and we can kind of do that and, and folks can jump in with questions as well. Press enter. Yeah, it's just somehow Jeff can't make you go. Go ahead, Caitlin. There's just a message that kind of blocks off the screen that I'm just trying to get rid of. No worries. OK, happy to jump in. Um, yeah, and I tried to distill down some types of partnerships and also um, some characteristics of of what I've seen in successful partnerships. So I can also just throw those out and we can see what sticks and I can jump into examples. Um, but first, just to give you a little bit more context on myself. Um, as Jeff said, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Climate and Agriculture and USAID. I'm in our Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security. So speaking of partnerships, we actually just merged. And it's great that now all of our food security and our climate work is under one bureau. So that's that's um, that's something I'm pretty involved in. Um, I'm supporting our agency's agricultural adaptation and mitigation efforts, trying to really accelerate action under our new climate strategy. Um, I'm today just speaking on behalf of myself, though, definitely not on behalf of the U.S. government. So um, I'll also be drawing on experiences I had, like Jeff said, when I worked at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I was the um, I was in the Foreign Agricultural Service there leading the team that was working on climate smart agriculture capacity building with um, other governments. Um, so that whole job was about partnerships with um, other ministries of ag mostly. And then I also used to work as a researcher at the CGIR. I was in the International Center for Tropical Agriculture um, working on decision support tools. Jeff, do you need a pause? No, no, it's good. We You're good, almost, okay. We almost had this thing go away, but uh, it's fine. We can hear you, no problem. We can see half yeah. the screen. To make okay. It can just be the 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 voice coming from somewhere. <laughs> that's also fine. Um. So, so that's a bit of my background. I have worked on programs in about twenty five different countries. Um. I've been based in Vietnam, uh, Colombia, and Kenya, and now obviously, like Jeff said, in DC. So if if there's any questions, um. Anyway, so that gives you a little bit about me, so you can know if you want to dive into some questions. So, in terms of some of the the partnership. So as a, I'm a policy advisor now, so I'm a lot less in the field. I used to do, you know, some of my early work was on community-based adaptation planning um, and really working with local communities. And I'm doing a lot more kind of on the global policy front now. Um, in terms of partnerships, so kind of came up with four buckets of partnerships that I feel like we dive into a lot. One is really um, driving commitments and investments. Um, so this year, I was quite involved. I'm our focal point in the agency for the agriculture innovation mission uh, for climate. Yay! I saw that. I saw the happy faces. I was like, "This that's a that's a sign of success." <laughs> um, I was just gonna say one of the one of the big things that often um, we're partnering for is really to make sure that we have kind of political commitments on key issues that we're working on. So one of the topics I work on is to really drive. Um, innovation in the agriculture sector specifically to tackle climate challenges. So that's been a really big push. Um, we've been working with the Department of Agriculture on that, um, on an initiative that the secretary there has led uh, with the UAE, which was the COP28 presidency. So strategic partnership, high profile, able to bring a lot of countries together. There's now 55 countries involved that have made on you know, public finance commitments and over $17 billion in commitments in general from the private or the public sector. So um, that's one type of partnership, really driving commitments, driving investments. Um, another one that I've been, you know, working on a lot is accelerating action, maintaining that political momentum once you have those commitments. So um, last year in, at COP28, the UAE announced this, uh, a number of declarations, but the one that I was involved in was the declaration on 
um, agriculture and climate action. Um, that was really to try to make sure that we are supporting countries and incorporating agriculture into their national determined contributions, which are their climate policies, um, and making sure we're we, we have this momentum, we're doing something with it. Um, so we also um, are part of a group that set up this new technical cooperation collaborative to support countries in implementing parts of the declaration or actually moving forward with ag and their NDCs. Um, so that's those are some examples of kind of the next tier down. You get the commitments and the finance, then you're um, coming up with these kind of targeted partnerships to support countries and taking the action that they've been they've committed to. Um, some of the partnerships we have are really to shift towards new approaches or um, innovation. So I, um, when I worked in the CG, we actually partnered with um, one of the African regional economic communities, COMESA, to support countries and think, this was about 10 years ago when they first started thinking about climate change and agriculture and this term climate smart agriculture came up. And everyone was like, well, what is this? What are we supposed to do with that? Um, how does that relate to the policies and priorities we already have in place? Um, so we partnered with, uh, scientists. So at the time I was a researcher kind of bringing that evidence, um, into the policy discussions with policymakers sitting down and thinking about, okay, well, what kind of programs or policies could we develop that would relate to this concept? Um, and that was, you know, really the vision of COMESA to do that and get ahead of that in the region. And they ended up with, uh, five of the first climates where agriculture policies in the world. Um, and, uh, we also had, I was also partnering you know, so that's still at the policy level, but kind of at a more local level, um, we have partnerships with a bunch of different research institutes who kind of are doing these um, innovation hubs, as they call them, which are actually taking the science and doing experiments with local communities to innovate um, in a way that has their preferences at the forefront and top priority to make sure that, you know, innovations are only as good as they are used. So if you innovate in a black box and you're not working in partnership with those that are going to use them or have other considerations that you, know, you might not be aware of, then your innovation will likely not be used or, um, you know, worse could actually cause harm. So um, so that's another key partnership on, on new approaches or innovation. And then the last one I have here is a little bit more on institutional change and behavior change. And this is looking a little bit internally. Um, one of the the previous position I had at USAID, I was in our, um, uh, what's it called now, climate uh, climate positive development division. Um, and we had to restart a new climate strategy. Previously, climate had been kind of in its own office, kind of separate over here. People were, oh, those are the climate people. Um, and there was a new vision to really make sure cli climate became something that was um, embedded into our programming across all of USAID. Um, our climate strategy was we it was a painful process, but it was worth it. We uh, partnered with every single bureau in the entire agency to really develop um, a holistic climate strategy that everyone could see themselves in, where everyone had ownership and trying to make it um, really a whole of agency effort in order to make sure that there um, we really had uh, the buy-in needed to get the outcomes that we were targeting really ambitious strategy targets uh, related to adaptation, mitigation, finance, um, and partnerships are actually part of that, especially with, uh, we call it critical populations. So, um, so those are some of the partnership examples I have. And I think some of the characteristics I've already drawn out that I've seen in successful partnerships is really kind of inclusive, um, inclusive processes that foster kind of genuine participation. I, uh, my undergraduate degree is actually in participatory environmental management. So I'm very, this is a <laughs> close to my heart, but I think about this ladder um, of participation that I used to refer to where you go all the way from like coercion manipulation to um, consultation to actual genuine like citizen ownership and just thinking about where you are there. And the second key part of that is being very transparent. Um, you know, these are the these are the goals that we have. You know, not every partnership can do everything. You can't be fully inclusive all the time. Like Jeff and I know with the, the National Climate Assessment, these are the moments you're going to have the opportunity to provide feedback, and then the, and then this is the and then this is who's going to have the pen after that. Just being very um, transparent and clear in those partnerships, I've seen um, is the is the way to be successful, or they can really actually backfire and uh, kind of derail your entire goals. Um, 
fostering atypical partnerships. So I would say kind of sometimes it's intentionally bringing people together who don't work together. Um, I'm an example of this that I could talk about in Tanzania, working with uh, four different ministries there, um, really trying to create some shared goals and then um, reducing risk for collaborating. So sometimes you need to, uh, and if the, I have an example here about finance, a new, a new finance mechanism that we have. So sometimes if you structure your partnerships appropriately, you can actually uh, create a space for others to join that. Otherwise, it might be too risky. And then really doing long-term collaboration. It's A lot of times it's the one-off efforts that are, um, are a little bit hard to sustain. So trying to keep it short, happy to talk about that more, have examples for all that. But over to you, Jeff. No, thank you, Damon. That's that's perfect because I give us even you're walking through some of those principles and lessons learned of partnership. Uh, obviously, there are ways we can dig into some of those project examples that you're talking about. Fantastic. No, that's great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Smucker, can we turn to you next? Sure. So, as I mentioned, um, uh, Thomas has got uh, years and years of kind of building these uh, partnerships in this topic space as well. Uh, from the different vantage point of, uh, of a scholar and a researcher and that's kind of applied context. And so perhaps some of your reflections would be, would be tremendous. Yeah, great. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate the invitation and it's great to be with the Humphrey fellows at last. I've been seeing, you know, posts on LinkedIn and, you know, I keep hearing these stories uh, about all the, the interesting discussions that have been going on. So glad to um, to, to join you this morning. Um, so uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm a geographer. Um, most of my research for um, you know the last few years has been uh, actually talking with, uh, with farmers and pastoralists in, in dryland parts of East Africa um, about, um, I guess, what, what we could call like um, spontaneous adaptation or the kinds of uh, adaptations that are um, sort of happening um, Within communities in relation to changing access to resources, um, other other factors that are um, kind of shaping dryland livelihoods, um, including the experience of, of, of shifting climate. Um, and um, but it, it, so I you know mostly sort of thought about this from uh, about adaptation from the perspective of you know communities that are um, you know that are uh, undergoing these you know these myriad changes. Um, but I, I did have the opportunity um, in the last few years to really explore um, the governance dimensions in more um, detail and kind of look at the kinds of uh, collaborations between different kinds of institutions, between um, particularly between uh, national and, uh, and local government, but also collaboration of, um, across the civil society government um, divide. And um, uh, so it's really kind of thinking about the, you know, the kinds of interventions from a, a planned adaptation perspective, right? So, um, so there's, you know, many institutions now thinking about, you know, adaptation or kind of rethinking development through an adaptation lens. Um, that, of course, intersects with the kinds of, you know, uh, coping mechanisms, adaptation strategies that, that happen at the, at the grassroots. And I think, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you've talked about many times uh, this, you know, during, during your stay, um, Adaptation is a is a is a multifaceted um, challenge, right? I mean, it is um, uh, inherently involves uh, multiple dimensions, and, um, and and it really requires you know different kinds of expertise. And so, um, so I, I think that's that's an important part of, uh, starting point. And I think um, we are starting to see like really innovative collaborations that bring together different kinds of expertise, um, you know, complementary objectives of different kinds of institutions, different kinds of organizations um, in this adaptation space, right? So adaptation, you know, very flex, you know, very broad term. I mean, a lot of different things, a lot of different uh, actors, um, and that, uh, that, that breadth provides um, a lot of possibility to explore uh, new kinds of synergy. So, you know, so one of the ways that we could think about this is sort of through, um, you know, by, by thinking about uh, new kinds of collaborations that cut across different sectors, right? So if we just kind of think about, um, uh, so we're mostly in, in Kenya and Tanzania, if you think about, um, 
line ministries or like sectoral ministries uh, within Tanzanian districts or Kenyan um, counties, um, we're finding that more and more, like, you know, even without sort of, you know, donor initiative, right, we're finding really innovative kinds of collaborations between local government um, departments uh, around some, you know, some shared uh, objectives. And so uh, multi-sectoral um, partnerships or, or collaborations are happening um, uh, across East Africa um, in, in ways that we didn't see even a decade ago, I would, I would argue. I'll just give you a, a, a quick example. Um, in, uh, in, in Kenya, there are several counties that have developed uh, a, a program that they, they're calling uh, Roads for Water. Roads for Water. Uh, so in Kenya, just as a, a kind of real quick um, context setting, uh, Kenya has a relatively new constitutional setup. It provides a constitutionally mandated slice of the national budget to county governments. Really substantial, you know, really substantial uh, funding. So we have county governments that have really substantial resources. Um, road construction has been a, a big priority, like just increasing the, you know, the um, uh, network of, uh, of roads. Um, and so uh, initially, you know, the, you know, as as plans for expanding road network were rolled out, there was a lot of discussion about, well, you know, how is this going to impact flood risk? Right, roads are going to create, uh, you know, new patterns of runoff. Um, has uh, some potential, uh, you know, risk implications for um, for flood risk. And initially, just through some very informal conversations um, between colleagues in in roads and engineering, in um, uh, the environment ministry, uh, in particular in Makueni uh, County in eastern Kenya. And then eventually um, the uh, agriculture ministry, right? There's discussion around if we think about this as you know, one, you know, trying to avoid uh, at least enhanced flood risk. Why don't we think about this from the perspective of access to water? And so agriculture was brought in, irrigation specialists were brought in to think about like how how could we um, design roads in a way, you know, using the topography and and, and, and patterns of runoff. Um, to create new water resources um, to expand irrigation. And so uh, Roads for Water, you know, kind of um, develops, you know, largely without donor funding, but in a way that um, has actually created uh, new water resources to um, uh, to enable like small scale, small scale irrigation, to enable uh, horticultural production. Um, so You've got roads and engineering, you've got um, you know, uh, the environment ministry, you've got agriculture, uh, and then um, uh, the National Drought Management Authority, which has presence in, in county government, um, they have a risk coordinator, they involve the risk coordinator to kind of think about issues of equity and who was gonna access the water, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that there was a uh, you know, strong uh, sort of gender component of, of that work uh, in terms of um, uh, expansion of irrigation. Uh, and then the health ministry um, came in and developed a wash component, right? A, a water and sanitation uh, and, and public health component, um, both because this, you know, is potentially a uh, source for uh, domestic water use, um, but also because of the potential for, uh, for malaria risk, right? Because you've got these new surface water resources. So, you know, you know we kind of see all of these different layers. We can kind of put all of that under a broad uh, adaptation um, uh, banner. And, you know, we're, so this is just one example, but we're like seeing um, in local government context um, and, and increasingly with also with NGO and civil society engagement, right? These really sort of innovative collaborations, right? Where we see these kind of multiple um, layers that, that relate to adaptation. Um, <clears throat> another way of thinking about this and thinking about different actors uh, in the adaptation space, right? Whether, you know, these, these different actors or institutions really think of themselves as you know or really see adaptation be kind of central to their mission or not, right? Um, I think we, we could think about um, institutions that have the technical capacity or who have a, a, a mission that is um, uh, that really targets specific climate impacts or forecasted impacts, projected impacts um, of, of climate change. And you know, I mentioned. 
um, managing drug risk, or sorry, managing um, blood risk, right? Be one, one example. Um, there are also many actors, right, who, um, who engage, who may be doing work very much relevant to, uh, to, to climate change adaptation, but are really, you know, more broadly engaged in what, you know, what we might call vulnerability reduction or, you know, development. We just, you know, just think of as, as, as development. And so, um, so another kind of uh, collaboration that we might think about or kind of partnerships that we might think about um, would be between institutions that have that kind of te technical capacity but are really thinking specifically about uh, about managing climate impacts and those that are, you know, doing um, uh, the kind of work that has been described as like no regrets adaptation, right? It's not tied to a particular um, projected impact of climate change. Uh, we could think about, you know, the development work, you know, happening around the world in terms of livelihood um, diversification, in terms of, um, you know, access to, uh, to microcredit or kind of micro lending programs that are, um, you know, they're really about livelihood resilience to multiple kinds of shocks. Climate could be one of those shocks, but these are this is kind of programming that is not like historically uh, maybe been specifically framed around um, around adaptation. And so, um, so I think that there, you know, we're seeing kind of new new kinds of collaboration along those lines. Um, there is a whole class of non governmental uh, actors that used to think of itself. Kind of narrowly in the disaster risk reduction space, and particularly in terms of disaster response, um, that that are really sort of reframing their work, rethinking their work, um, you know, through through an adaptation lens. And I'll just give you a, a quick example of the Kenya Red Cross. Right, the Kenya Red Cross, you know, for the last forty years has been mostly about responding to um, to disaster. Right, it's been you know. Rescuing blood victims, it's been about you know providing um, drug relief uh, and so forth. And um, Kenya Red Cross, the leadership of Kenya Red Cross in the last decade has made it very clear that they really don't want to be in that business anymore. Right? They they believe that their future is one of uh, of enhancing resilience of, of um, uh, you know enhancing capacity, right? And and uh, and, and reducing vulnerability. That's a that's a longer term adaptation challenge, right? They, they just want to get out of this sort of cycle of respond, you know, responding uh, in, in a kind of humanitarian fashion uh, rather than, uh, than reducing people's uh, vulnerability to these shocks that we know are coming, right? I mean, you know, climate change or not, right? Drought is, a, is part, of the, part of the climate cycle. Um, so, so that would be another um, way of kind of thinking about uh, partnership, different kinds of, of institutions. And then lastly, I would mention, um, uh, you know, kind of thinking about, um, you know, relationships between, uh, between national and, and, and local institutions. Um, probably most of your uh, home countries have in place a, a, a policy uh, or a set of policies that relate to devolving capacity for climate change adaptation and for disaster risk reduction to local government, right? Most NGOs, likewise, right, are very much interested in like how how um, kind of local level capacity uh, can can be enhanced. So in the in the DRR space and disaster risk reduction, you know, there's this national, uh, sorry, international uh, sort of framework called the Sendai. Sendai principles very much, you know, very strongly oriented toward uh, enhancing uh, DRR governance and, and really building capacity in the local context. Um, again, like national adaptation uh, plans that, you know, that, that uh, many, many countries in the world, especially in the global south, have gone through, you know, huge emphasis on, um, on local government um, capacity. And so, um, so we're finding that, um, and certainly in the in the Kenyan and Tanzanian case, that the local institutional landscape is a really exciting place of you know sort of um, innovation uh, to some extent of, of experimentation. Uh, I think it's it's a uh, space that donors are looking at very very closely. In fact, we see, uh, and particularly in the Ken Kenyan context, um, 
donors engaging directly with, with county governments, right? Where in the past, all projects would kind of go through national ministries. Uh, we're finding sort of direct uh, engagement and funding of projects and, and kind of closer relationships between international donors uh, directly with, um, with county institutions, right? Uh, and in particular, where we find like county institutions uh, in collaboration with, or, you know, some role for, uh, for, for national minist minist uh, ministries, but also uh, working across the government um, civil society divide. One of the really fascinating things that we found when we were interviewing people in, in, in county government uh, in Kenya, as well as in civil society, it's just the extent to which um, staff had moved back and forth between civil society organizations and county government, right? This is totally a function of the fact that county governments now have resources, right? They have competitive, they're paying competitive salaries and so forth. And so um, there, there's a whole um, new generation, most of them are very young, you know, master's degree, sometimes from, from Europe, uh, you know, advanced degrees from, you know, Kenya and Tanzania as well. Um, and professional experience that is both within government and civil society. And what that means is that you, you have uh, people within these, these institutions that, that really understand the partners that they're working with, right? They understand the limitations, but also the capacities that exist within, within civil society, uh, you know, and, and likewise the, you know, the capacities, but also the rigidities and so forth and, 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 and modus operandi of, um, you know, of, of local government. And that has really been, um, that has really helped to propel uh, partnerships uh, forward. So, um, yeah, so multi-sectoral, you know, uh, vulnerability reduction and kind of more kind of technical uh, climate impacts focus. And then, um, you know, kind of thinking about uh, these devolutionary processes and in uh, local government spaces, local government, civil society, collaborations as these kind of laboratories for uh, for innovation and partnerships. I think those are the three um, three dimensions of the partnership that, that I would want to highlight. Well, that, that's terrific, Tom. And, and that last point about going between civil society and NGOs and, and government is a, a great lead into testing of some of your experience because you have uh, in, in some respects played those different roles. Maybe some of your reflections on partnerships in, in the Gambia and it's in the kind of larger context that you've also operated. And I'll say before you start, Smart maybe in preparation for you after Teslima, could you come up here? Because I'm mindful that we want to make sure Caitlin can hear you. And I think by being all the way at the other end, um, she won't be able to hear you when it's when it's your turn. So we can set you up over here. Teslima, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first, um, my name is Teslima, I'm from the Gambia. Um, I have the privilege of um, showing very two curves uh, in uh, this um, climate financing um, advocacy or negotiations. I've served as um, government policy um, negotiator, of course, also in the UNFCCC climate change um, conferences, where I go as a party delegate. Um, discussing about issues of the government, of course, negotiating, negotiating this um, climate uh, financing. But of course, also, I've also, you know, um, gone back, um, work as an activist, a climate activist, but of course, on the team side space, trying to also ensure that those finances that we have advocated for, um, we've lobbied for, um, is also tripled down um, to the very people that are actually in need. So um, eventually, I've had both experiences. I would like to share uh, my experiences starting from um, how I got involved into issues of climate change um, negotiation, um, boiling down to uh, how do we lobby for funding. Um, firstly, when uh, we talk about climate change financing, this is where we go, um, countries negotiate uh, with um, communities or with countries that uh, we believe are emitters of you know companies where they also feel like they're also investing into ensuring that uh, countries are well equipped to resist um, issues of climate change and then whereby and then institutions or those you know um, countries or um, companies 
would actually try to say we're supporting um explicitly least developed countries or this global south, I would call them to ensure that they are building resilience towards this. Um, in my role as that negotiators, and the Gambia also would also have pledges to say, okay, we're working on um issues of resilience, we've actually tried to make so we are not actually doing anything more um in terms of greenhouse you know, gases, but we are suffering more in the impacts of climate change. Thereby, we would need to be um, compensated and in ensuring that we can be, you know, um, building those resilience and also supporting uh, national uh, adaptation funds. So the Gambia actually does have a national adaptation fund, and the way they set it up in terms of that, we try to advocate to ensure that we incorporate or involve everybody, especially those people who are actually, you know, victims uh, that are affected to also have say, and then so that it will reflect on them. Um, as an activist, uh, although those negotiations have gone well and Cambia succeeds in actually securing funding from um, these institutions, for example, uh, we've gotten uh, money from the uh, Green Climate Fund um, that supports local communities. And then this will be sent to central government. Um, although we do not have, like Kenya, where we have um, local communities are able to get direct funding from um, other donors, most of the funds that come goes to the government, and then government as opposed to now have um, subvent uh, local governments now actually you know, get it to the community. Um, so my advocacy was trying to see that because that channel most of the time you see it's flawed because funds that were supposed to meet or meant for the very people that are actually facing these um, private issues do not get it um, at the end of the day because it's stopped within government or maybe uh, local government and it does not actually be beneficial. As an activist, we try to advocate for uh, these issues. But of course, we're not only advocating, but raising awareness for community members to understand that uh, these are awareness available to support these issues that communities are facing. And how do we also speak up to ensure that they raise their voices to demand for what actually belongs to them? And we have actually you know, um, succeeded in that because we try to ensure that we build capacities in communities to demand, but we also try to build that partnership between government and communities to actually go to these very people and ensure that um, issues, I mean, uh, funds that are available for them uh, is actually uh, given to them. But not only giving, but also building capacity. You know, uh, you don't only just supply or give them funds, but also you need to make sure that um, you're building capacity for them to manage that very well. Um, they are also able to ensure that they are uh, trained on how to. Um, Resist issues of this uh, disaster that come like Dr. Um, uh, my prof um, rightly mentioned issues of disasters that come into place. Um, how do we respond to that? It's not only about going to say, okay, there is a huge disaster that comes into play, and then you go to the community and give them bags of rice. And that's actually what happens in most of the cases, right, in terms of response. So we we'll buy them bags of rice, or we will um, buy them um, this iron uh, corrugated and to build their roofs. But these things is recurring every year. So how do you ensure that you try to make these communities are um, resistant towards this? You ensure that you prepare them in advance to know that, okay, this pathway is where when it rains, this is a pathway for the rain, and maybe communities should not settle that or resettle them, or try to make sure that they are actually uh, in areas where they are avoided. So planning that goes into uh, issues of internal balance planning. So I have worked in these areas where I have been um, going down to local communities, trying to you know, raise awareness, but also being that middle passage between government and these um, local uh, communities as well. So I have had um, put down a list of um, also funds as I know most of us are working in these spaces um, in terms of trying to um, lobby for funds. Uh, uh, um, I know that um, for governments, actually, government work with um, um, classic, you know, funds from the Green um, Climate Fund, which actually supports uh, projects in developing countries on issues of climate change. But typically for NGOs, um, where it's very difficult to try to get direct funding from funders or donors, um, mostly what I have experienced and I've seen uh, personally being involved to the African Youth, in, uh, African Youth Initiative on Climate Change, we were able to secure um, the World Wildlife Fund and the Green Space um, Grants, which would actually then um, be given to um, like the National Youth Council 
to actually manage on behalf of a civil society. Um, that's going to ensure that it is implemented and the project goes to uh, in a very smooth way. Um, these are areas that we could actually, but also there have been philanthropic um, uh, individuals, but of course also maybe uh, institutions that are willing to support issues of natural disasters, issues of resilient building, uh, issues of anything that's climate change um, related for um, institutions or civil society to champion and ensure that they um, get the um, issues. But we also encourage or we try to also advocate for governments to involve or invest, particularly in my country, the Gambia, into renewable energy. We know it's very expensive. Um, it costs it a lot to think, especially in my country, is not um, attainable. For example, we still you know, uh, rely on fossil fuels because a government thinks that it's cheaper, especially the national uh, electricity supplier. They may we have only one, we do not have a case of climate taxes, mostly run by government. And so issues of um, renewable energies um, is discouraged because they feel that it's going to now um, weaken the actual institution that is responsible to supply for this. So we have also tried to ensure, you know, I have colleagues that are working in this industry, industry uh, of institution to see how best we also leverage in these technologies or in this uh, renewable energy um, grants that are available, how do you now incorporate that with the national electricity company that is doing it and ensure that we now transit into that? It might take a while, but yeah, basically that has been uh, our work. Thank you very much, Jessalina. And uh, you're ending with a focus on energy and fossil fuel versus renewables, a great transition to many of the issues that uh, SMART has worked on in Nigeria, obviously a very fossil fuel rich country, but one that he's um, through this climate lens really focused on exploring uh, renewable energy and trying to understand the um, kind of connections with donors and, and community-based efforts. So SMART maybe sharing that as well as your Hydric Oil Foundation experience and such, lots of, lots of interesting partnerships that you've been part of building. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jukuma Smart. I'm with you from Nigeria. Um, I, uh, I, my experience, I have experience in the non profit sector. I always believe that the government alone cannot do it. You know, um, the work cannot be left alone with the government. And the experience I've had with government have shown that uh, um, people in the private sector or non governmental sector, they contribute immensely to national development. So I've always come um, from that angle. Um, um, even though I am a climate change activist um, for since 20, since 2012, when I graduated from, from my undergraduate program, um, but I've paid much interest in renewable energy, energy assets, especially um, when I've seen the uh, energy deficits in Nigeria, um, but especially people in the rural area do not have access to electricity. And also, um, even in the urban area, uh, we've only seen how um, lack of uh, electricity um, has uh, prevented or hampered the success of uh, businesses, even if it is a uh, um, small, medium enterprises. So I've just picked interest in that area. So um, I, I started my activism in 2012, uh, 20, 20, 2012, um, from just a rural community. I, I, I was trying to talk about climate change. Uh, there is a community, especially the community I come from, they, they, they had this uh, mostly agrarian community and actually have this kind of belief, maybe because of lack of exposure, um, that uh, the challenges that they face you know, back home in terms of um, um, their agricultural practices not being uh, productive sometimes, a certain period that, that was a year, um, they had to do second farming in that same year instead of once because of what? The, 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 the plants did not grow, the agricultural practices that they didn't work out. So they were believing that, oh, they would have been suffering from the, the omen, you know, that this kind of superstitious belief that the gods are, are punishing them, you know, gods, gods are punishing them for a crime they committed, you know, some of them will go and carry a um, live animal, you know, they go to the waters, they go to the hill, the mountain, they make sacrifices, oh, please forgive us for this we did. 
because we this is what we depend upon. We this is all we do. This is our primary economic activities, and right now we are suffering this. So this practice, you know, have been the and they, I grew up in this community. So even though as a as a Christian believer, uh, my family never practiced that. But I these things do happen. So um, that's why I appreciate education so much. Um, it was when I was doing a during my undergraduate program in geography that I had much about climate change. Normally, on one or two occasions, I've heard about climate change. So I was wondering, is this a problem or is this a solution? So, <laughs> so because of due to lack of interest, I didn't bother to know you know what it was until during my undergraduate program. So I was able to understand that climate change is actually a problem, you know. And then right now, it could only be a solution to certain things. Uh, because of uh, maybe uh, opportunity given to create green jobs, you know? so this is that was how I entered into the uh, activism. Um, so uh, there was a, this uh, program the women normally hold in the southeastern part of Nigeria. It's called August Meeting. August Meeting. Uh, it hosts every year, every year, every August of the year. So they held that one. So I was thinking that okay, I just graduated from the university and. Uh, I do not have what it takes to organize a formal town hall or um, maybe a workshop in order to create sen um, sensitize the people, let them know um, what climate change is all about and how climate change is also affecting their agricultural practices. So that was it. So I had to meet the leadership of the women for that, that event, and they granted me an opportunity to come and speak with them. So that was the first time I I thought about planning, but it's like, oh, I have so much to say. <laughs> where, where do I, where do I, you know, so I spoke to them and it was just like an opener, both for them and for myself. For them in the sense that I was able to, um, the sustained advocacy within that period, you know, was able to make them understand that there was not like gods, you know, these are natural things. These are consequences of climate change. You know, that was why they were having those those issues, you know. So that perception really helped them. And then I started studying about climate smart agriculture and the world how to bring it to them, you know. So they, well, I understood that it couldn't end there. It couldn't just give people an information without providing solution. You know, so now <laughs> I didn't know what it takes to provide solution. That was the where the idea of um initiating um a non-profit, you know, came in, even though. The non-profit I initiated, it wasn't where I started. But then I was already started working with a different non-profit called the Center for Social Justice. Um, they are truly into public finance management. And when I joined them in the same 2012, I was uh, focused on the area of environment, how they track funds, just as, as you mentioned, how they follow, follow the money, how they track funds um, allocated to environment from the government. But you see, uh, sometimes government will say, okay, we are giving uh, 50, they were budgeting 50 um, billion naira for purchase of um, utensils, presidential utensils. And also, what I'll do, we're just comparing, okay, buying utensils for, for the presidency or maybe the Ministry of um, Finance and also providing funds for climate change, which one is a priority? So, this is exactly what I'll do. So, I will, I will pull out, go to do what, what they call budget pull out. You know, I do comparisons between um, what we call frivolities, budget for frivolities. We have documents produced from that, and budget for frivolities. So we pull out all those things. You will see a ministry, they want to buy from, uh, the budget for um, 200 pieces of computers this year. You know, next year, um, the same ministry will budget another 200 pieces of computer. So some of the arguments I make when I was working there was like, if this is uh, a private computer, you bought the money, are you, are you going to? Buy the new computer by next year if, if there's if nothing happens to the computer. So we're using this argument to write reports, you know, and then send it to the um the National Assembly. So they look at it it's like a recommendation, they look at it as okay, um, reduce this. So before budgets are put, they must have looked into the pullouts that are done, you know, to know which one, and then they'll be able to save more money. The argument is that I wanted to save more money from this frivolity. And put it into this planet, into this environmental issue. So that was what I was actually doing. But um, so after about three years, I I decided to initiate a non-profit um, called the Climate Transformation and Energy Remediation Society. And uh, and then fortunately, I I I think that twenty that should be twenty two um, two thousand and fourteen. 
2014, I held uh, um, a, what they call a climate match in support of uh, um, a Paris Climate Agreement. So I think that was the first time because of the success of that event. That was when a, a German uh, organization uh, noticed us because we use media. We are covered by several media, both uh, um, DW, um, Al Jazeera, and BBC came, several media, international media and local media. So that was, they noticed us and they invited us for a meeting. So they saw the source and they asked me, what made you to um, carry out this program? I told them that I've noticed that uh, um, there were about 50,000 as a lens people that gathered in Paris for a Paris Climate Agreement, 50,000. But someone like me, I don't, I don't even have a name in my, in my locality. So if I go to Paris, my voice is going to be swallowed. Um, so nobody will hear me. Um, but if I stay here and do something locally, um, I think I'll make an impact. That was what I used to sell myself to them. And it's okay. It's okay. Um, what exactly is the plan? I told them I wanted to make sure that the Senate, I, I create an attention to them that they need to take action, climate action. They need to make more robust budgets in favor of climate. They need to make sure that budget allocated for agricultural practices and climate work, smart agriculture for the rural women in other localities, not mine alone. That was how I started partnering with um, the Hemiswo Foundation. The Hemiswo Foundation is actually a, um, a green party. They are, they, are, they are also government, they are called in the government, uh, government arm. Um, they are the way we have the Democrats and the Republican here, we have several parties. They are equally a party called in the Green Party. So that's what they are. So they provide um, money um, in favor of several development projects. So the, the area that I partner with them is the area of uh, um, climate change, especially in the area of renewable, renewable. So they really have so much passion for um, renewable in the um, developing nations. So for since, two, since 2016, I have really been working with them. Um, they have been providing my um, nonprofit funds to do several um, of several projects in the area of renewable energy. Most of them are let's say technical um, in terms of um, if you want to train civil society organization, um, sometimes we will probably be the media on how media could craft, like what we were talking about yesterday, how to craft, um, how to craft a, a communication. You know, sometimes these are the things I do, um, provide all the um, climate and renewable energy, the languages and for the media. That's how we look into the other report. Um, sometimes it could probably be the provided forms in the area of going to communities that depended on, on, on um, the local forest. They cut down their trees to make firewood also for sustenance. There's a, a village called uh, Uje in Abuja, FCT. They depend just there. Just that, I just use those ones just as a pilot. Many local communities depend on the same firewood. So my advocacy was on the area of how do we mobilize one to provide them pilots, um, um, opportunities like clean cook stove, um, wonder bags, clean cook stove, so that even if, even if we are unable to provide um, the entire community with clean cooks, but at least the awareness must have been there that so oh, there is an alternative way of using energy that is cleaner, more sustainable, and will also protect the environment. So that they will stop cut, cutting down those trees. So in several locations, um, they are equally um, they are equally funded with my, my non-profits by providing funds for a project in the southern part of Nigeria called the uh, Ross Rivers. Um, the governor, even though he said he was a, um, an a, a environmental biologist, but he was, immediately he came, he wanted to destroy, wanted to build about 270 kilometers super highway, super highway, and that project was to, um, was going to eliminate over 70 communities, and there was no plan for compensation. So I looked at it from the angle of um, environmental degradation, the forest, uh, deforestation is going to cost. So I began a campaign in that angle, and then, fortunately, the Bo Foundation and Equality came and they said, okay, we want to support this project, the campaign over it. So we, we used the media and we went to the communities here and then brought the women, the local, the local communities that were going to be affected uh, for them to come and do a, a peaceful demonstration to the federal minister of environment in order to create an awareness. So we use both media, we use street uh, um, um, demonstrations in order to communicate our 
our message to the government to, to make sure that to make sure that the take action. And that was how that project you know, was suspended. That period, we were able to make a, my team and I were able to make the government, the federal minister, environment to demand what they called environmental impact assessment. In fact, we wanted it to include social, so it was like environmental impact and social assessment. So that was how you know you know um, we kept doing it renewable energy, um, forest conservation. And then I was equally getting grant from uh, from um, Audubon Naturalist here in United States. Even though their own funding was not much, but it really helped and um, that angle of forest uh, conservation in, in UK in Abuja. So that's that's on that that's uh, basically what I did with the uh, Henry Book Foundation. Um, then Henry Book Foundation does not work in the absence of uh, GIC. You know the GIC um, because I came here and I chose to do uh, a thesis. Subject of international development assistance and catalyzing renewable energy in Nigeria um, towards reducing um, carbon emission and also energy assets. That's exactly what I am looking at. And unfortunately, two of my two of my experts are here, so I appreciate that they are here listening. So, so, um, so they don't work without um, um, Henry's book does not work without GIZ. So, um, like GIZ, um, just like the government. That's a, that's a, the word I cannot pronounce it, it's just a German word. So they provide Henry Bo, you know, funds on several locations. I could remember um, the, the former uh, uh, non-profit I was with, I remember when they provided about 30,000 um, to do a project on a budget for climate change. I was the person that handled that project. Um, um, so the GIZ provided the money to Henry Bo Foundation, and then Henry Bo Foundation gave it to the project to Center for Social Justice. And for the fact it was on climate change, so in Apple on my table. So I was the person that produced the documents are available online. You know, I can always I can always share them. Um, I was able to um, develop three and uh, ten reports for different ministries in Nigeria, including um including environment, minister of power, minister of housing. There are about ten of them. So the, 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 the reports are put online, I can always share them. So what I'm why I mentioned this was was uh, GIZ. That provided it. So I was when I got to know their interest that they oh they're actually doing some things in Nigeria. Um, but one thing I want to talk about GIZ is that it's not only um energy that they're focused on, they're only focused on several other things when it comes to um, the, um, policy angle, when it comes to government, you know, um, um, improving governance. So they were involved with it. Particularly what I worked with them um was in the area of energy, and I didn't work directly with them. So I was working with money, the money they provided to the Henry Foundation. So it's like from this stage to another stage. So, so, so basically that. So now um, that was when I was okay. Since I've worked with these people, when I was making lists of people, I really wanted to study their um, their um, uh, climate finance interventions in Nigeria. I listed a lot of them: um, World Bank, European Union, USB, USA, ID, and. So, but he asked me to narrow it down to, <laughs> to today. I'm beginning to appreciate why he told me that. So, um, I, so if, during this research, I was able to, you know, find out more more intervention that GIZ is doing in, in Nigeria. So, um, in the near future, um, I'm equally looking at um, trying to study more of what they do, especially in terms of the money that they provide. So, I'm not going to limit it to just just this an academic thesis I've written. You know, um, I I still want to go ahead to look at it. And even if it means developing whatever uh, um, platform I want to disseminate my information, whether it is fact sheet or engage them on advocacy, whether I'm here or online, in order to make sure that oh, the promises you've made um, towards uh, green um, uh, climate finance in Nigeria is being implemented. So these are the kind of things I have interest in doing. Yeah, common theme with what Tesla is. Well, let's, uh, so four very rich interventions and, and thank you so much. A lot of kind of diversity, but some some commonality, certainly in approach. Why don't we uh, open the floor to kind of questions and comments because you all have uh, experience in these, working in these sectors with these different actors, public and private, public and different levels and such, and maybe get a, a couple of those out on, uh, on, the, on the floor for discussion. I would like to ask about clim uh, green climate fund. I don't know this fund's character and who set, who uh, donate this fund and for whom? 
uh, this pond should be uh, used. To, I don't know at all. So yeah, no, please, that, uh, that, that's great. So maybe yeah. Teslima and then also Caitlin can speak to some of these international international funds. Teslima, you want to kick off with your experience? Yeah. So the Green Climate Fund uh, actually these are funds that are mobilized. Uh, by governments and it's managed by this institution that uh, it's called green, I mean, green, uh, green Climate Fund. So these funds are geared towards um, supporting governments' um, agendas towards, you know, uh, resisting systems or adaptations towards climate change. And so institutions or governments apply towards them and then they get disbursed to them to ensure that they support their projects um, in implementing this. So the last time I checked, um, the director of the Green, uh, Green um, Climate Fund is actually from the Gambia. I didn't know until when I met him in COP. I was so surprised because I was there trying to say, oh, we need so, you know, we were negotiating. And apparently, and I realized that when he introduced himself, it was like, it's a Gambian. And I was like, okay, then that's very, very interesting. But that was my first time also having that engagement. But um, it goes a long way in ensuring that supporting, especially in least developing, uh, developing countries like the Global South. Uh, in towards their efforts, you know, in the fight against climate change. Caitlin, you want to reflect on whether it's Greek Climate Fund and the other international institutions that U.S. government's partnering with to try to uh, advance some of these programs? Sure. Um, yeah, on the Green Climate Fund, uh, you know, the U.S. is definitely involved um, on the board and um I guess what I would say that kind of resonates with one of the points earlier about getting like, where does the funding go to? Um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing a lot, like, you know, I'll speak from a personal perspective, not from the government's perspective, but um, certainly um, I think the global community is pushing for those funds to make sure they get down to the local level and also that they're disseminated more quickly given how urgent the issue is. So it's about access um, to who and how quickly you can get those funds. So they have created um, kind of like other mechanisms, these simplified processes that are trying to streamline how the funds can get through. That the GCF came out of the the UN process. Um, so you know, I guess that's 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 a specific. You know, they have a specific governance structure and things like that. I guess the the other thing that I would just say just about finance. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about public sector finance. And I think that's really important. We want governments to commit to providing finance for this. Somebody mentioned budget lines. It's a really good example of, um, you know, what you track is what gets done um, even within our own government. So I think that was a, that was a really good point. And just to say that we also realize, you know, the public sector alone is certainly not going to be able to finance the transformation that's needed to address climate change. So we are also partnering a lot with um, private sector companies. So I think it's, also understanding um, that those models, why why the private sector invests, you know what what they can support, uh, what are the incentives needed. So I, I feel like we're you know trying to take that two pronged approach of the public and private sector side, and also looking at those partnerships that we can have. I had talked before about kind of de risking investment. Um, we announced at COP this new um, also what is it? It's a financing for agricultural small and medium enterprises in Africa which is basically like public finance coming in and saying, we'll take on some of the initial risk. Um, and so if some of these loans default or you know certain things happen, we have some initial capital that we've put in, but it allows for the private sector to come in and take more risk um, to address like climate adaptation, for example, in spaces they might not otherwise. So those are some things that jumped out from comments earlier. I, I guess the other thing I just wanted to say, reflecting on this conversation, um, and some conversations I've had globally in the last year is really like, given how urgent this is, we're looking for partnerships that are really transformative. I, have, I work with one group that talks about radical partnerships um, and just thinking about what we can do to really push on specific leverage points that will uh, lead to some of the transformation that we need to see for climate change. So um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, that temporal dimension is a really important one, right? Because of the scale of the crisis and the need to move quickly and partnerships while kind of positive and bring different constituencies and capacities to the table, they also take time, right, in terms of relationships. Yeah, Tom, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, I just wanted to um, mention sort of on the other <laughs> end of the scale, uh, I mean, as, as you know, massive as, as these adaptation challenges are, 
there are also I think there's something to be said for um you know for for piloting mm -hmm. partnerships and and thinking also about like small grant programs um one of the organizations that we work with and actually we're going to be bringing uh students to, to Kenya in a study abroad program this summer uh with an organization called Institute for Culture and Ecology they pursue a kind of um uh agroecologically informed uh vision of, of uh Food system transformation or food system adaptation. Um, they participate in a small grant program with also with GIZ uh, in, in Kenya, and this uh, th they have a small grant currently to kind of um, pilot a partnership with with local ministries of environment. Um, and so that can be sort of a, um, a you know a, a testing process, a way of kind of you know developing proof of concept that might be a stepping stone towards going for larger larger funding. Um, after that, kind of establishing a track record of, of uh, collaboration between between new partners. And some other questions. One of the oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, before I add to what Tesla said, I uh, have this this uh, um, photo I saw. Uh, I think I shared some on, on, on Twitter some time ago. Um, there was a park, the park of Britain, um, Green Park. Green parking. You want to say the way we have this park here? Parking lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Green yeah. parking lot. Uh -huh. So they call it green parking. So uh, a, a man with, with a, a, a green pickup, he drove his car and parked it there. <laughs> so he got parked there and left. So, so he really, not everybody will understand that joke. You know, uh -huh. not everyone will understand what that joke. So he parked. <laughs> so he parked his pickup there, and the 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 vehicle that he parked there, you know, is well with. For safe with normal, normal gasoline. <laughs> so the only thing that is green here called the pickup is yeah. green in color. Yeah. You know, so the, the story is just like not everybody understands what green means when it comes to um when it comes to um fighting solving climate crisis. Yeah. Not everybody really, really understands this story. But we talk about green finance. <laughs> somebody, somebody might think if there is a nation that uses a, a note, a denomination that is really called, say, well, this is really yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so it's very important that when crafting stories, you know, we should always try to explain what the what finance means. So um, then in addition to what he, he what he said, um, I probably I've probably noticed that um not only the government is providing the, you know funds for green finance, you know, um uh, even the oil companies, you know, back home. I will always use Nigeria as an experience because I really have um, what I call grassroots experience with all these things. Um, they were, um, the other Dimitri that spoke yesterday, he talked about how terrorists, you know, try to attack uh, oil companies in Nigeria. I really wish he was around so I would address that issue, you know, things like that. So we be, with Nigeria has been having this issue of uh, um, environmental degradation from oil companies. Oil companies, the Shell, the Chevron, the Slumbaja, all of them, they've been destroying there for many years, since 1956, you know, when oil exploration began in Nigeria, you know, things like that. But what I've noticed in recent time is that the are well, even though they are copies, even though they are the one, you know, contributing to environmental degradation in Nigeria, but I've noticed that in recent time, they are equally providing funds that goes towards um, green, green, green finance. <laughs> You know, so, so that's just an addition because he said government program. So I don't want to say that I have in recent time I've noticed that um, private organizations, private institutions, they are now they are now beginning to appreciate sustainability, they're not beginning to appreciate um how to protect the environment and then having whatever body they have, no matter the scale, provide towards that. So all of all this gear towards um green green finance. So I can see that not people are not giving it to only the government to, to do, you know. And when I talk about African Development Bank, I don't know what I should call them government. I should call them private, you know. To, you know. <laughs> World Bank is World Bank private or government. So these are some of the things. So, so we, what I mean in navigation, you know, there are several other um, players, you know, actors who are equally providing money to support, whether it is from the international level, like United Nations or World Bank or whatever. To um, national and also regional governments. Good, good, good. Other, yes. Um, we are doing the climate change, how to solve climate change, and we are only one that uh, finance is 
uh, a huge aspect in the process of soil removal. And what I want to know is what is the current landscape of uh, climate finance? Uh, what are the mechanisms available at the, the inter international level for developing countries? And also, what are the mechanisms at the local level that our countries, developing countries, could develop inside, uh, inside them in order to raise the fund locally? Caitlin, can we turn to you and ask about the landscape on climate finance? I, I realize that's a big and varied landscape, but from from your perspective, the, how that's playing out? <laughs> we have a whole huge team working on that. Um, yeah, I, I don't work as much in that space. I guess I would just say, um, and this kind of came up a little bit before, but there's a real push to increase climate finance for adaptation specifically. There's, you know, the majority of climate finance is going towards mitigation. And actually most of what we've talked about in this conversation today has been about adaptation. Um, so there, there's a lot of effort in trying to crowd in finance um, for adaptation. People are looking at different types of these, uh, like blended finance models, they're uh, looking at how to get the private sector to invest more in adaptation. You know, there's the conversations going on globally about the carbon markets um, for that reason in terms of like private sector incentives. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to say other than at the moment, it's not at the scale to really address the challenge, especially when it comes to adaptation. I think that's come up a couple of times. Um, the Green Climate Fund is kind of the, one of the main climate finance funds. There's also the SIFs at the bank, the climate investment funds. Um, but that's, yeah, it's it's a, it's a real deep dive, deep dive topic. But I guess I would just say the biggest challenge is um, we're not where we need in terms of scale and also in terms of the sectors, like adaptation itself, and then also the sectors within that. So I obviously work in ag. And I think like 3% of climate finance goes to ag, even though it's one of the most vulnerable sectors. So um, yeah, we've it's a, there's a lot of people right now trying to work on this for exactly that reason, because it's not, we're not where we need to be. Yeah, so why don't we get these two final questions from the fellows and then because we're unfortunately close to the end of our time, but make sure we get both of these. So maybe Kara and then Pim. All right. Um, I think this is for Caitlin, just coming off the finance and moving more into partnerships. Um, she mentioned something about atypical partnerships and I work for cultural heritage preservation and adding that culture-based discussion to climate change, um, more recently trying to pull in other agencies, our environmental management authority, Institute of Marine Affairs. Um, it's very easy for us to work within the culture sector because the museum and the archives, we all participate really easily, but Getting those other agencies on board was extremely difficult over the last few years, just getting a seat at the table for us for them to hear what we have to offer. Um, so I just wanted to know, like, what are some of the methodologies you've used, you've used or you know for tackling those types of, you know, partnerships that you're trying to create? Okay. And then, Pim, before you answer that one, Caitlin, we'll have get Pim's question, too. I have more than one question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll terminate this yeah. session and future ones too. All right. Okay. But Tom is a uh, is very it's easy to say like uh, we do a collaboration and by the synergy explore the synergy. But could I could you explain more how you do that? Like uh, you work the way that you work. Like uh, you find you searching for the collaboration for the government for local for any other stakeholder, what, what you do in, in, uh, in Kenya, right? And also for uh, Kathleen, you, uh, you, might, you may just like a, a little bit touch about institutional change and we have a world change. So could, could you explain more about that thing, like uh, what, how, how it works and how, how, how should we focus on about that? Okay, so I, I, I missed the on um, institutional change. And uh, yeah, insti institutional change and behavioral change. Behavior. Beha institutional behavioral change. Okay, great. Terrific. Well, uh, Tom, do you want to take Pim's question first and then we'll turn to Caitlin for a final word? Sure. I thought I would have 30 seconds to figure it out, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
that, that, that's fine. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I guess just to, to clarify, I mean, my my role has mostly been on the research uh, on the research side uh, and kind of studying the, how these collaborations have uh, have emerged. I think one, you know one of the dynamics here is just kind of understanding the complexity, like the multi like um, uh, dimensions of, of adaptation, and realizing that um, that sectoral approaches just are are not adequate, right? And that you have many different uh, institutions. All of them have quite limited budgets, and they're trying to, you know, make change, you know, at scale that kind of cuts across multiple areas. So, um, so I, I think that in part the, you know, the emergence of collaboration has been, you know, uh, a function of just recognizing that um, that that impact can be much much greater when when resources are are pooled, right? So that's I think a, a really critical um, part of the, part of part of this. So. Um, so I guess my contribution has been more around, you know, just understanding some of the some of the conditions, like the changing um, kind of expertise of staff, the sort of um, uh, ways in which different kinds of institutions are, are rethinking their missions in, the, in an adaptation uh, context. Um, that, that, that 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 just kind of creates an environment. Um, institutions, you know, like the culture ministry, and you know, maybe a, you know. A, uh, environment uh, ministries are are um, ha have more momentum to to come together, and I guess that's you know before we really even we haven't really talked much about you know engagement with climate science right, and so I think that's another um, dimension of this. It doesn't have to be part of uh, adaptation you know uh, collaborative initiatives, but um, it could be also another kind of piece of the puzzle. So I'm not sure if I'm answering you, <laughs> but but you know. At least if I made up the 30 seconds, so if I come up with something, sure that works. <laughs> right. Uh, Caitlin, we'll, we'll turn it to you for a final word for this session, but certainly not the final word on the topics. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I, so on the atypical partnerships, interesting to hear that story about, you know, what you're trying to do in terms of cultural heritage space. I, I think for us, um, some of the things that I've seen work. So I, yeah, I'm not to say it's not a challenge. Uh, I think getting a lot of those folks together at the table doesn't happen naturally for a reason, right? We're all like used to talking with those that have shared values. Some of the things that I've seen work for us have been um, just leveraging a, a relationship. So if you can find someone that has that initial point of trust and having them advocate for you, I mean, that has that's that's I think key to getting a seat at the table, getting that in. But other than that, um, we've kind of a number of the processes I've been in, involved in that have had uh, kind of diverse viewpoints at the table, uh, having a neutral facilitator there uh, that can help to find, even if it's one small shared goal that you can start to tackle together, just the experience of tackling something together and creating informal spaces for dialogue usually has opened the door for all, all sorts of other things after that. So even if it's not tackling your main goal first, but having something that you can collaborate on together as a small shared goal, goal just building builds trust. I can't emphasize that enough. The whole space for humanizing each other and building trust, I think, creates um, opportunities to do things that um, that wouldn't have been possible out of the gate. You just went in with, you know, maybe your strong viewpoint and, and first objective. So um, that stands out for me. I think it's amazing how much of these solutions happen because of relationships. So much of what we do is relationship based, and so I think just um, also fostering fostering those informal relationships and creating uh, space outside of the formal dialogues. I know there's people there have been involved in the negotiations. Is we all know is really key um, for the institutional change. I would just say um, with I, you know what I was referencing in that space was our uh, the climate strategy we were able to kind of create mandates and also i think so that helped you know having having a mandate that you can fall back on but also um i would say every institution is different in terms of what incentives work within it so doing some careful uh kind of cross checking or feeling the pulse on on what would actually create behavior change or institutional change which within each certain structure, what are the actual incentives is key. So kind of doing a bit of a mapping on um, in, in each context on what those incentives are. They're very different for USAID than they are for the bank, than they would be for, you know, 
uh, civil society organization working in a specific community, but just understanding what those incentives are for behavior change and then um, tackling those. It's it's amazing how often we think we know what would incentivize behavior change and it is, it is not actually true. So um, that would be my point on that one. Thanks, Josh. No, oh, thank you, Caitlin. And thank all four of you for sharing so generously your uh, experiences and insights from those. Uh, obviously, a wide ranging uh, set of topics, but that was kind of our objective to give you a sense of the diversity of the partnerships uh, and in all these different kind of dimensions of climate change. Um, so uh, join me in thanking our guests for, for uh, this really rich conversation. Thanks again, Caitlin, uh, for, for beaming in. It, it definitely worked, uh, especially uh, from your side. Once we got the little thing off the screen, we could see you fully as well as hear you and um, uh, look forward to being in touch. Yeah, so Caitlin and I were on the international chapter of the National Climate Assessment. So we'll, we have the National Climate Assessment as part of the follow-up resources. So you can read all the hard work that, that we did on that chapter and with lots of the... <laughs> Public review and comment response. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. That was fun. Nice to hey. meet you all. Take care now.